funding for this video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you. With over a thousand monsters to choose from in D&D, it can be hard to know which ones to use, and even harder to know how to play them. What weapons do they favor? What tactics would they use? How do they interact with other types of monsters? These are all questions that can come up to DMs that are looking to make their combats more enticing for their players. It's certainly one that I struggled with. That's why I'm back today with another monster breakdown for D&D. Hello again everyone, I'm Bill from Alt-Roll, and today I'm going to dive into a brief history of a D&D creature, how that history was adapted into 5th edition, and how this lore can help game masters make their combat encounters better. So, whether you're here for the cool lore breakdown or for the combat tactics, I'm hoping to give you a lot more to chew on when it comes to the monsters we face in D&D. For episode 19, let's unclog our ears and be serenaded by the song of The Harpy. The Harpy is a half-human, half-bird creature that originates from Greek and Roman mythology. Their physical descriptions varied depending on who was describing them, with some writers like Aeschylus listing them as ugly or disgusting creatures, whereas writers like Hesiod described them as fair-locked, winged maidens. Ovid's description was the simplest, however, stating that harpies were simply human vultures. Their mythological origins depicted harpies as wind spirits, personifications of the destructive nature of wind. They would swoop down to steal food from people who were eating, most famously in the story of King Phineas of Thrace. Curva. Like many monsters of myth and legend, harpies remained in the imaginations of storytellers well into the Middle Ages and beyond. In Canto 13 of his Inferno, Dante Alighieri envisages the tortured wood of the Seventh Ring of Hell infested with harpies, torturing those who committed suicide. They also made an appearance in the works of Shakespeare, both literally in The Tempest and figuratively in Much Ado About Nothing. In the modern day, harpies continue to make appearances as story elements or antagonists, appearing in media such as the Narnia series, Fantasia, Dragon's Dogma, and Dungeons and Dragons. The harrowing shrieks of harpies reverberate through the mountains and canyons. First found in the Greyhawk supplement in 1975, the harpy in D&D was originally described as having the lower body of an eagle and the upper body of a human woman. They had a deep hatred of humankind and similar humanoids, and would go out of their way to kill them whenever possible. To do this, they would use their sharp talons, weaponry such as a club or short bow, or use their luring song and charming touch to trick humanoids into fighting for them while the harpy kills and eats them. While their appearance in the AD&D Monster Manual in 1977 likened their lower half more to vultures and clarified their charm effect and language, their abilities remained largely the same. In Dragon Magazine number 115, released in 1986, two articles were written by Barbara Curtis and Ed Greenwood expanding the lore and ecology of harpies. In these articles, the basic biology of the harpy is explained, such as how they lay clutches of up to 20 eggs. These articles also clarified their charm effect, with elves and bards appearing to be resistant to their luring song, but someone who is sleeping will find it nigh impossible to ignore its effects. Later editions made some… interesting design choices for the Harpy, adding more details to their lore while keeping their main combat abilities relatively the same. Second edition further clarified that a Harpy's upper half is ugly, which is just rude in my opinion, but also established that they live in caves near the coastline. Their charming touch was nerfed a bit, causing the target to stand there mesmerized for 21 to 30 hours instead of just doing the harpy's bidding. While this means characters wouldn't have to act against their party, 
They were still unable to move or react to anything, making it all the more easier for harpies to devour them. Third edition is where things got weird. In this edition, the harpy is now a half-human, half-reptilian monster, looking like an evil-faced old person. They still rely on their talons and song in combat, but the harpy archer was added as well, which is just a harpy with a longbow. Rather than attack and kill humanoids on sight, 3rd edition harpies may enter into mercenary contracts or extortion schemes, using the threat of their luring song to make merchants or artisans pay protection money. 4th edition returned to the bird-like harpy of prior editions, but added some fun mechanical changes that I wish were carried forward into 5th edition. The first big change is that harpies gained a screech ability, where they would scream so loud that they could burst eardrums with thunder damage and daze targets. Harpies also gained resistance to thunder damage, likely to avoid screeching each other to death when in close proximity. Other than those changes, the Bloodfire Harpy was also added, whose song could literally cause a target's blood to boil. Harpies were also changed to speak common, and it was clarified that they never fight fair, fleeing from combat if things don't go their way. In 5th edition, harpies are described as a combination of the body, legs, and wings of a vulture with the torso, arms, and head of a human female. The product of a divine curse, the first harpy was originally a young elf who encountered Fenmarel Mesterine, a reclusive elf god in the forest. His visage stealing her heart, the elf god fled, and the young elven woman begged for the help of the gods in luring him back. Erdri Fenya, elf goddess of the sky, heard the elven woman's cries, and appeared as a bird to teach her a song of beauty and seduction. When her singing failed to draw Fenmarel Mesterine to her side, the elf cursed the gods, transforming her into the first harpy. Haunting coastal cliffs and other hazardous areas to non-flying races, harpies only attack if they have a clear advantage. While the beauty of their song will entrance travelers into natural hazards that make them easier to prey on, if a target puts up any semblance of a fight, the harpy will flee, choosing to attack easier prey instead. When they do attack, harpies tend to play with their food, torturing and dismembering their prey before devouring them. Once they're full, the harpy will collect any baubles or treasure that catches their eye, and take them back to its nest in a cave or ruin nearby. Now that we've examined their lore, let's pivot over to the harpy's stat block to take a look at how they work mechanically. Starting at the top, we have their size, creature type, and alignment. Size in 5th edition defines the space a creature takes up in combat, with a medium creature taking up a 5 foot by 5 foot square or hex on a battle map. Using the 3.5 edition Dungeon Master's Guide, shown here, harpies can be between 4 to 8 feet tall and weigh between 60 and 500 pounds. Their creature type is Monstrosity. Monstrosities are monsters in the strictest sense, and serve as a catch-all category for creatures that don't fit into any other category. Alignment broadly describes a creature's general outlook on the world, and combines their moral beliefs with their attitudes towards society and order. The alignment of the harpy is chaotic evil, meaning they act with arbitrary violence, spurred by their greed, hatred, or bloodlust. Below that top bar are the rest of the Harpy's stats, which are essential for the Dungeon Master to play them in combat. The Harpy has an armor class of 11, 7d8 plus 7 hit points, or 38 on average, has a movement speed of 20 feet, and has a flying speed of 40 feet. Looking at their ability scores, the Harpy has 12 strength, 13 Dexterity, 12 Constitution, 7 Intelligence, 10 Wisdom, and 13 Charisma. With 10 being average for an ability score, 
Harpies have high strength, dexterity, constitution, and charisma, average wisdom, and low intelligence. For their skills and proficiencies, the harpy has a passive perception of 10, speaks common, has a proficiency bonus of plus 2, has a challenge rating of 1, and awards 200 experience points when killed. For offensive actions, the harpy has a claw attack, a club attack, the luring song ability, and the multi-attack feature, which grants it one claw and one club attack per attack action. The claw attack has a plus 3 to hit, a reach of 5 feet, and deals 2d4 plus 1 slashing damage on a hit. The club attack has a plus 3 to hit, a reach of 5 feet, and deals 1d4 plus 1 bludgeoning damage on a hit. The luring song ability has the harpy sing a magical melody. Every humanoid and giant within 300 feet of the harpy that can hear the song must succeed on a DC-11 wisdom saving throw, or be charmed until the song ends. The harpy must take a bonus action on its subsequent turns to continue singing, but it can stop singing at any time. The song ends if the harpy is incapacitated. While charmed by the harpy, a target is incapacitated and ignores the songs of other harpies. If the charmed target is more than 5 feet away from the harpy, the target must move on its turn toward the harpy by the most direct route, trying to get within 5 feet. It does not avoid opportunity attacks, but before moving into damaging terrain such as lava or a pit, and whenever it takes damage from a source other than the harpy, the target can repeat the saving throw. A charmed target can also repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. If the saving throw is successful, the effect ends on it. A target that successfully saves is immune to the harpy's song for the next 24 hours. Lastly, we have their environment tags. When using digital resources, we can see that harpies can be found along the coasts, forests, hills, and mountains of the wilderness. Now that we've gone through and sorted out their stat block, we can begin to relate the harpies' lore and abilities to how we should be using them in combat encounters. Specifically, we're going to look at how they behave, how they would approach a combat situation, and how to get into the mind of a harpy if you want to fight effectively as one. How do we do this? Well, we'll need to take the lore and stat block of the harpy and compare that with how that information is intended, referencing tactics and interpretations from The Monsters Know What They're Doing by Keith Amon. Let's start by going through Amon's key assumptions one by one and relating them to the harpy as we go. The first of Amon's assumptions is that most creatures want to survive, and if seriously wounded, will try to flee combat. Exceptions to this rule are fanatics or intelligent beings who believe they'll be hunted down and killed if they do flee. Seriously wounded can be subjective, but we can assume that threshold to roughly be one-third of the creature's health. With an average of 38 hit points, one-third of that would be rounded to 13. Given their cowardly nature, if a harpy were reduced to 13 hit points or fewer, or if combat started turning against a group of harpies, they would begin to flee combat. Next up, let's look at how their alignment can impact their thinking. On the scale of good to evil, good creatures tend to be friendly to others, whereas evil creatures are hostile to others. On the scale of lawful to chaotic, lawful monsters may try to capture or non-lethally subdue others, whereas chaotic monsters would just kill them. Since harpies are chaotic evil, we know two major things about them. First, since they are chaotic, harpies will try to kill and eat their opponents. Secondly, since they are evil creatures, harpies are outwardly hostile to other creatures. Continuing with their mindset, let's dive into some of their mental ability scores. Harpies have an intelligence score of 7. With regards to intelligence scores of 7 or less, Amon states, 
A creature with intelligence of seven or less operates purely from instinct. That doesn't mean it uses its features ineffectively, only that it has one preferred modus operandi and isn't going to be able to adjust if it stops working. As stated in their lore, Harpies will only attack if they have a clear advantage. While they will coordinate with one another to mix their luring song with melee attacks, if targets resist their attacks or the luring song ability, they will not know how to react or change their tactics. Harpies also have a wisdom score of 10. With regards to wisdom scores of 8 to 11, Amon states, A creature with wisdom of 8 to 11 knows when to flee, but is indiscriminate in choosing targets. Harpies are described as lacking the cunning to adapt, and would rather flee and go hungry than risk straight-up combat. So, while they may choose a target that is a little too tough for them, the minute they start losing, a harpy will attempt to fly away. Now that we've set up how they think, let's look at the harpy's physical abilities that influence how they fight. Thinking like a mon, we can assume the following. Creatures with high strength focus on melee combat and won't need to compensate with greater numbers. As such, they won't need to outnumber an enemy to be willing to take a fight. Creatures with high dexterity will prefer to attack with ranged weapons, and if it's intelligent, the creature may lay traps as well. Creatures with high constitution typically have a hit point advantage over their enemies, and because of that, they're less likely to hide in combat since they can soak up a couple attacks before going down. A creature with a feature that gives it an advantage or gives its enemy a disadvantage will always prefer to use that feature. To recap our earlier stat block examination, Harpies have high strength, dexterity, and constitution. Comparing that examination to the assumptions we put forward, we can deduce that Harpies are opportunistic hunters that seek to incapacitate and kill their targets as quickly as possible. Moving in groups, or flocks, one Harpy will attempt the luring song to trick targets into falling into a natural hazard, while the rest of the Harpies fly into melee to use their multi-attack, prioritizing those incapacitated by the song first. The last major premise from Amon is that in D&D 5th edition, unless otherwise specified, any creature gets their full movement, one action, one bonus action, and one reaction just like any player character does. Amon posits that any creature that exists within the game world will have evolved in accordance with this rule, and it will seek to obtain the best possible result from the action economy of the game. This means they will combine whatever movement, actions, bonus actions, and reactions are available to them for the best possible outcome. When it comes to the Harpy's action economy, the best way to maximize their damage per turn is by utilizing them in groups of at least two. One Harpy will use the Luring Song ability, charming and incapacitating nearby creatures. This will open up those creatures to attack from the other Harpy, who will use their multi-attack feature to attack with their claws and club. Regardless of whether they're lured or not, the Harpy will also favor hit-and-run tactics with its flying speed of 40 feet, diving in and out of melee range so that they're always able to end their turn just slightly out of reach. So, with all of these assumptions laid out and applied to Harpies, what do we now know about how to use them in combat? First, Harpies are predatory hunters that prey on travelers from above. Moving in packs, they will coordinate with one another to defeat and torture their prey, before finally feasting on their remains once they've had their fun. Second, despite their predatory nature, Harpies are cowards and will begin to flee combat faster than most other monsters. Should a fight turn against them, or should they not be able to take down their prey after a couple rounds, they will disengage and begin flying out of range as quickly as possible. Third, in combat, a group of Harpies will have one use the Luring Song to charm and incapacitate as many targets as possible, 
while the rest fly into melee range. Once in range, the Harpies will simply claw and bludgeon their targets with multi-attack until they're all dead or running. Fourth, if reduced to 13 hit points or fewer, reduced to half their starting number, or if their leader is killed, a Harpy or group of Harpies will begin to flee combat. Their flying speed of 40 feet will be enough for them to get away from any fights that they need to, but should flying become impossible, their slow movement speed of 20 feet may cause them to turn and fight if they can't get away. Fifth, if Harpies win a combat encounter, they will torture, kill, and devour their prey. Sadistic and gruesome, Harpies will play with their food, taking their time to dismember them slowly until their target finally succumbs to their wounds. With that, we come to the end of today's video on the Harpy. An opportunistic hunter of humanoids, the Harpy is an interesting monster to throw into the wilderness. While they pair well as an added threat on top of natural hazards such as quicksand or rock slides, when approached purely on their own, a pack of them can still be a deadly threat for unprepared adventurers. However, what I want to know is, what do you think of the Harpy? Do you like luring adventurers to their doom with this flying foe? Or do you tend to overlook them when you're building encounters? You can let me know down in the comments, or you can discuss it on the Altworld Discord using the link in the description. While on the server, you can view our courses that teach the basics of D&D, if you like what we do, supporting us on our Ko-fi helps us keep the server going, and make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon to be notified when our videos go live. However, that's all I had for you. Thank you all for watching, make sure to have a great rest of your day, and I'll see all of you next time.